Larry, I've been working on this for some time, but I didn't know where it's in now. And you know the seven I am's? There are really eight in John. Isn't there any of the other three writers? They're called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're, they're almost identical. The only thing different in them is who they are. Luke is a physician. So he has all about the birth of Christ and things in his life. Uh, Mark is a servant. He has all the things about Jesus as a servant. Levi is a tax collector. So he talks about money and how you give and different things like that. John was unique. John was a personal friend of the Lord. And uh, you find that in the last chapter of the Gospel of John. He tells about his personal relationship. He mentioned things that they never even thought of. And he quoted seven times that Jesus said, I am. There are, you've heard this before. There are two words for that. That's a verb. Uh, if you clench it. Uh, there are two words that form that. One of them is the Greek word I may. Spelled E I M, but it's pronounced I may. And that word means I am eternally existent. You'll find that in John 1 1. In the beginning was the word, that's I may. The word was with God, the word was God. The other word is in Genetai, uh, in Genito. Uh, that one means to have been created, to have been made. So the I may created the Ingenito. That's us. And uh, But when Jesus spoke, he never said himself in Genito. He always said, I may. The only thing I angry when they heard that. And sometimes when he said it, they would take up stones to stone him. And he called himself God. He would pass through the crowd. You remember uh, how he was able to do that. John broke down the seven times Jesus said, I am. And that's what's always quoted in the scriptures. And, and uh, they're all found in the Gospel of John. Run over there real quick. We'll get started here in a minute. But you know, there is an eighth one. The eighth I am. And I'll probably just mention it at the end. But here are the seven specifically that John mentioned. And they have a they, they have purpose to it. And we'll look at the I am. He said, I am the eternal one, is what he's saying. By the way, the best point of that in Scripture, one time the, the, uh, prop, the uh, Pharisees and the scribes were arguing with him. They said, where are our father Abraham? And, and he did discuss it with them. Jesus looked at him and said, before Abraham in Genito, I made. So what did he say to him? Before I created Abraham, I was the creator. And the next verse says that immediately they picked up stones to stone him. He passed through the group and they weren't able to stone him. Well, this is the word that John picked up on that seven times Jesus said, I am. And my, they're fantastic in what they teach us. Everything has its motive. And when you see the number five and you see the number seven, something that's mentioned that many times, take a close look. It's got great meaning. Seven is the number of completion. Seven times Christ told you everything you need to know about Him as the Creator. And here they are in the Gospel of John. And uh, three and five is the number of grace. Boy, well, just look for things that are mentioned five times, and you'll see that there's no works involved. Three, of course, is the most precious. You get quiet when you see those. That's God. God the Father, God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. So when you read your Bible, look for, for those groupings. Uh, one is a good one, two is not. Uh, you know the numbers and what I'm going to study, or will study next Sunday and Sunday, I'm still on the Holy Forum, uh, is the number 12. And I'll show you how they get these numbers and, and why they're used. But here today, I want to speak about the seven I am's. I'll tell you what the eighth one is at the end of the sermon. Uh, Father, I'm kind of in a stuck spot again. I'm not sure why this is happening. I certainly don't mean to create confusion. I don't want to turn it the other way and say, this is you just doing this to get me to preach what you want me to preach. I never to do that anyway. I'll find that other sermon and bring it out. But right now, I've got this one. It's pretty well prepared, and I'd like to deliver it to 
proceeding. Bless the word to our hearts use. Bless Brother Randall and the Elmer Baptist Church that are in a real strict. The people that took in his associate's place, uh, I believe they were sick or what might have been dying. And here he is uh, with all these people that are sick and in and out of the hospital and that COVID really running over the top of his church. And he and his wife, thank you that Betty was released from the hospital and bless her now and strengthen her. She walked close beside her husband, and I pray you watch over them and their church. Bless this message tonight. I'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you the outline. You don't have seven spots. Uh, by the way, we print extra bulletins, so you bring one in the evening and write the, uh, the outline down. It's fun to take down the outlines. Another way to do it is write them in your Bible, put them in the margin, and reference the next verse. To go through there. The first one is in John 6. He said, I am the bread. We'll come back to it in a moment. And then right after that in John 8, he said, I am the light. John just said, man, man, you're in he's right on this now. As the Lord says, he said, I am the bread. I am the light. And then in chapter 10, he said, I am the door. You know that word. By me, if any man enter in, uh, he shall be saved. Uh, then the, the fourth one is in chapter 10 also. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd watches over his flock. And uh, I am the good shepherd. Then number five is one of my favorites in John 11, 25 and 26. He's talking to the lady. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So he is the resurrection. And then in chapter uh, 14 verse 6 number 6 he said I am the way the, the truth and the life no man cometh to the father but by me and then the seventh one is in chapter 15 verses 1 and 5 twice he said to good number that's emphatic I am the vine the vine is connected to the to the the roots of all that and the branches come off of the vine. He said, I am the vine. We've already prayed. Now let's go back and look at these. Turn with them if you to them if you will. A lot here that I'm not going to put in here that I would if I developed this the rest of the way where I was wanting to go with it. But uh, this one is mentioned four times. Four times is east, north, south, east, and west. And put in your outline, I am the bread. And let me give you a, a, a letter outline to go with this. Put behind it in parentheses, sustenance. Bread is sustenance. It's what you take in, along with meat and other things that keep you well and keep you strong and give you your uh, the ability to live out your life. And he said, I am the bread, chapter 6 and verse 35. He said, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger their sustenance. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So we put the, the bread as part of along with the, the water for thirst. And he gives it here. I am the bread. I sustain you. Sustenance sustains you. At times you can fast. Uh, it is good to fast now and then. It, it's not what people make of it. Uh, Figure out fast. If you just take the word breakfast, it isn't breakfast. It's break fast. So how long did you go without eating? All night. Uh, that's not hard. You're asleep anyway. And when you wake up in the morning, you break your fast. Now that that fast can start earlier in the day, and there are purposes for doing that. But uh, break, breaking the fast, you slept all night. You uh, cluttered yourself of all these things. Now you need sustenance. That's physical. But all of these have a spiritual application. And here, sustenance is eternal life. I am the bread. He said here, I sustain you. You you will have the life that you live now, and you'll have it through your entire life. I mentioned, and I got a kickback from uh, a couple of missionaries and Dr. Nelson that I had mentioned uh, that he had led me to the Lord and that he had his 97th birthday last Monday. 97 years. 
that fellow's preached it. He's still writing books and goes out and preaches his beauties. It, God has sustained him, no doubt about it. And, but here it is mentioned these four times. Chapter, verse 35, 41, 48, and 51. And four is the number of widespread. The north, the south, the east, and the west. I just went east and west. Uh, the, the bread is spread out. It pictures a feast. One of the things that there is not the main part of the meal, but bread sustains you. And in this day, they ate bread. But he really put a note to it. It was impossible for the unsaved to believe it and to understand it. He said, I am the bread. Except you eat this bread. You and there, you, what, are we, what are we cannibals? They don't use that word. We're, we're supposed to eat you. That's been carried over to Catholicism through the communion. When you take communion and you're a Catholic, you are observing transconsubstantiation. Is that a big thing? That means that you take the bread, the priest dips it in the wine. He says, I can beat you with a game of dominoes. No, you can't. That's the chant. And, and then he puts it on your tongue. Now, next time you're talking to a priest, ask him, when I swallow that, or when somebody swallows it, what does it become? And he has no choice but to tell you, it becomes the body and the blood of Jesus. You, you realize how big Jesus must be if Catholics have been eating him? every time they take communion for over all of these years, they actually teach that. Uh, one guy put it to a priest this way. What if somebody just swallowed that and I cut their throat and I pulled that out, what would I bring out? The priest had no choice but to say a piece of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Come on, you're smarter than that, so am I. It's not talking about your physical sustenance. The bread is and it's here here. I am the bread of life. The word life there is the word eternal life. He's the bread. He is the one that can give you eternal life. The one we'll see here in the letter he said to the lady, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, if, uh, I'm the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives in that life uh, shall never die. So sustenance here is eternal life. You ask yourself tonight, do I really have this down pat? Do I know for certain that I'm saved? I have a uh, guy in my church years ago. He's a retired pastor. His wife was a pastor's daughter. And uh, she was in the kitchen after service. I remember the next morning. He came to the kitchen. She was crying. He said, what's wrong? She said, I'm not saved. The boy in panic, he said, well, what, what do you want me to do? You want me to call the pastor? And he was going over, the, and he turned around and looked around, she smiled at him. She said, never mind. I'm safe now. Do you know what it takes to get saved? You have to be lost. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if a person's never been lost, you can't add Jesus to what you are, to your repertoire. You have to come separately and just put your faith and trust in Him. And you eat Him. <laughs> not, not physically, but you partake of the risen Savior and He gives you, He sustains you with eternal life. That's why we'll never go to heaven. I hell doesn't scare me. It scares me that I know people that are going there and I'm not doing a very good job of stopping them from going. But hey, for us, what's the Bible say? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be present with the Lord. I got I know you did that for me. Then I was trying to find it. No, we do it. Uh, we're, he sustains us. Boy, there's a lot here. Let's move over and look at the second one in chapter 8. Then again, it was mentioned four times. And in that third time, he got very specific. He told him, I'm talking about me, my body and my blood. You, that's the partake. To sustain us, we have the body and the blood of the Lord. Then in chapter 8, verse number 12, isn't it amazing? None of the other writers picked up on any of these. Except for one. 
And that's the eighth one. Uh, but John had all said no. Chapter 8, verse number 12. Now, this one is named twice. What is true is in, 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 in the first idea of it, it pictures separation. But two, when it's used in like something's mentioned twice, it means it's emphatic. Peter, God looked at Jesus, looked at Peter and said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired thee to sift thee as wheat. The fact that he mentioned it twice, it's going to happen. And after you're converted, the word there is after you repent, you get your life straightened out, then you can follow me. But Satan's going to get you. That number two is an emphatic. So here we have an emphatic. I am the light of the world, he said in chapter 8 and verse number 12. Then spake Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light. Now look at the word. The light of life. That word life is eternal life. This light shines for God. And it's mentioned twice in chapter 9 and verse number 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. By the way, how many times is Jesus called light in the Bible? Two, Genesis chapter one. And let there be light. God said, let there be light. And there was light. That's Christ. Then you go away over to Revelation uh, 19, 20 and 21, and put those three chapters together, and, they, and they'll say, the old heaven, the old earth, the past way, new heaven, new earth, fear, but the new heaven, the new earth, have no need of the sun. For Jesus is the light thereof. Genesis 1, 4, that's Christ. Revelation 19 through 21, three or four verses there, that's Christ again. How many times you mention it? I am the light of the world. Now, the bread was sustenance. The light is satisfaction. Uh, in that sermon I preached, I thought I would preach that here. I was going to be preaching in another church. I preached it in Kirk, Colorado, that Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And one of the things the light provides is comfort, peace. The, the, I gave the illustration, I'll try to give it quickly. When I lived with my aunt and uncle, my aunt raised chicks to labor uh, chickens that she could sell to people that wanted hands to lay eggs and they wanted to get chickens to butcher. She bought the chickens for a quarter each. This is back in the 50s. And, uh, and she'd buy 50 at a time. And she would bring, they'd bring Uncle Art would bring those home in the trunk of his car. Exhaust fumes and back roads to get there. The car bouncing up down. He'd bring in this big box, heavy cardboard. He'd put it on a table in the hen house in a special room. And when he'd lift that lid off, those poor little chicks are just friends. They're suffocating from the exhaust. They've been jostled around. They've lost their environment. And sure enough, there were four or five in there that had died. Or, and he had even five extra. So he took the dead ones out, threw them in the corner. I had to get rid of them later. If you want to know, I'll tell you sometime what I had to do with them. Uh, but they were just frantic there. The box was this high. Those little chicks are jumping, trying to get out, and they fall back down. And they said, Oh, I, I looked at that up. Boy, I would say, Man, I'm going to hear cruel. Uh, you treat these little chicks like that. Well, Art moved a lamp over there. It was on a, on a stick, an old kind of lamp, a kind of canonical. And he put it right over the top of that three foot square box, turned it on. There was this two foot globe of light in the middle of the three foot box. And I say that just roughly speaking. And those poor little chicks are, they're not peeping, they're about screaming. And they're running into each other. Another one died. I picked that up and told her over in the corner. Mostly a friend. Poor little chickens in there. And so he left. I said, I'm going to, uh, he turned light out. I said, I'm going to stay a little while. So here were these chicks and they're going. Some of them are bigger, not very old, but some are just tiny. And all of a sudden, the bigger ones moved under the light. And pretty soon the little ones saw that they moved in with those chicks kind of under their wings. And pretty soon here was a two-foot fuzzy ball of yellow hair saying, the comfort of that light shining down and the closeness of those chicks being together gave them the comfort
comfort, and pretty soon the whole bunch of them were sound asleep. Came back in the morning, I think one more had died during the night. But within a few days, they turned loose and running all over the farm. He did, they did, did their beak off. They, 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 that light fascinated them. Those older ones knew what light did. And light is satisfaction. You get under a warm light. They use it in tanning of all things and uh, different things like that. Uh, the, the light provides this, in, this satisfaction. Uh, I wanted the word enlightenment, but it does start with an S. But that's what light does. Matthew 5, verse 14 and 15 talks about the light. Oh, some other verses also, but I won't go through those. You know Christ. Here's the light. It's right here in this book. Everything that tells about Jesus, every, and everything here does. It starts in Genesis 3.15, the, the first subject. Well, Genesis 1.4, Genesis 3.15. Uh, Christ, the seed of the woman, the, the signal, bruise your heel, but you'll crush his head. That's Christ on Calvary. There it is in the Old Testament, thousands of years before he was ever born. And it's light goes all the way through the revelation when the earth has no need of the sun, for Jesus is the light thereof. That light will shine over the earth and over the Jerusalem and over the temple. And it just brings satisfaction to your heart. Well, notice the third one, John 10, verse 7. And this is a couple of mentioned here. John chapter 10 and verse number 7. Then said Jesus unto them, Nobody else mentioned it. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, look at it twice, verily. I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. And, and he goes on to explain this here. He actually, the shepherd in those days would bring the sheep in. You know, sheep followed the shepherd. He could call them by name, and they followed him wherever he went. And he would bring them to the pen at night, step out of the way, and they would all go inside. <coughs> Then the shepherd would lay down in the gate, the opening of the gate. No predator could find its way inside. He could see the walls to make sure no wolves came over the wall. So here he is. First he's our sustenance, then he's our satisfaction, and here he is our security. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. You talk about a secure place behind the door. Don't you love that painting where it shows the Lord? I can't remember, not Raphael, whoever it was painted that one. And and uh, Jesus is at the door and he's knocking. And then there's shrubbery all around. It's an old, old painting. I think the Catholics own the original. There's one particular thing in the scene. All these paintings said something that stood out. The door didn't have a knock. It was just a door. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, the latch is on the inside. I, I'm old enough to remember Uncle Ben's house and it had a string that came out through a hole in the door and it was attached to the latch. And you grabbed the string and pulled it. The latch went up and you came in the house. But at night, Ben would pull the string back inside the house. You couldn't get your finger in that hole. There was no way to open that door. Ben had to open it from the inside. Well, that door in that painting, they asked the question, what's missing? People are looking for sandals, they're looking for berries on the bushes, they're looking for sunlight. Finally, they say, there's no door now. Well, this here, uh, this security is the Lord, and He is the door of the sheepfold, and the sheep are inside. It's mentioned a couple down here, 7 and also in verse 9. He said, I am the door. By me of any man enter in, he shall be saved. It can't get any plainer than that. You must be in Christ or you cannot be saved. No church can save you. No baptism can save you. No priest can offer you anything in communion or anything else that can take away your sin. Only Jesus. By his precious said love, he becomes the door for the sheep.
and he is our security. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we go with that. I look at number 4, chapter 10. Also, in verse 11 and 12, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd given his life for the sheep. And uh, then let's see with it, uh, we want to, uh, let's see where I'm at here, the good shepherd. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, mentioned twice again, just like the door. I am the good shepherd, watch this, I know my sheep and am known of mine. What did the good shepherd do? He gave his life for the sheep. He's the sacrifice. Christ died on the cross of Calvary. See, Protestantism, I think I mentioned this a while back, Catholicism teach that when Christ was baptized, Protestants or Catholics who were left, but they brought everything with them. Catholicism teaches that Christ took your sin and mine, the sins of the whole world, on himself when he was baptized. Then he carried it for three years. And when he went to the cross, he paid for it. Dude, that's not your Bible. My word. Peter said, for, for he bore our sin in his own body on the tree, first Peter 2 8 or somewhere in there. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. What do you what why do you suppose all of a sudden Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Because God with his pure eye can't look at sin. And he's seeing his son dying, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden his son is covered with the sins of the whole world. He becomes a sacrifice for sin. And when he did that, God turned his back on him. The Bible says for four hours, God could look at him. Imagine it only took the Savior four hours to pay for everybody's sin. All the way from Adam, through the ark, and on clear down to here. Live today, 7.8 billion people. It's estimated that that many people have died since the ark. 15 billion, 16 billion people and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's own Son, cleanses from all sin. Are all saved? Certainly not. You cannot be saved without receiving the gift. If somebody gives you a gift, it's yours to thank when you take it. And then when you take it, it's yours to open and utilize all that's in that gift. That's what your salvation is. The, the Bible says, the wages of sin is dead. What are wages? Something you earn. Something you pay for. If you work all week and you come in and uh, say to the boss, I like my paycheck, he can't say, well, I don't think I'll give you one this week. You want a lawsuit? There's a lawsuit. There, there's a, a law that prevents that from happening to you. You earned it. And let me tell you, you earned hell. That's all you earned. Your sins have condemned you. How many have to commit? One. Whoso would attempt to keep the whole law, but is guilty at one point, is guilty of the whole law. It's like a funnel. Cross over everything. God says to you, depart from me, I never knew you. But to know Christ is to have that sin put away and to be able to hear God say, welcome to paradise. You've been faithful over a little. I'm going to make you ruler over much. And, and it's all right here because the Good Shepherd became the, the payment for our sin. Now to go outside this a little bit, the Shepherd is mentioned three times in Scripture. Uh, three, twice here is one time. As the uh, Good Shepherd. And then in Hebrews 13, 20, he's mentioned as the Great Shepherd. And in uh, 1 Peter 5, 4, he's mentioned as the Chief Shepherd. He just keeps growing in that position, which is the position of a sacrifice for your sin and mine. First, uh, John 10, verse 27 and 28 are so important with these two points. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And what's what they know? They know him, they follow him, and they give from him eternal life. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. How long is eternal? Forever and ever. And they shall never perish. How long is never? Forever and ever. It's, it, it's uh, forever in the other way, in the other direction. You, you not only you live forever, but you'll never perish. And neither, listen to that last part, 
neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. This is the, the one who is our sacrifice as well as our security. And he's, he's done all this on our behalf. I was going to mention something else for that. Uh, maybe I'll think over here in just a minute. So we have the bread is our sustenance. The light is our satisfaction. The door is our security. You can never be lost in that good. And the good shepherd is our sacrifice. He died on the cross to give you eternal life and for me as well. Well, there's another point I want to cover with that. Look at chapter 11 and verse number 25. 11 25. Here's the one I've quoted twice already. This is uh, Martha. Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, our brother would not have died. And her sister had told her that, and they cajoled Christ with it. And Jesus purposely didn't come because he wanted Lazarus to die. He wanted to prove what he's telling her in this verse. If you'd been here, he'd not die. Jesus answered back, uh, Thy brother shall rise again. She answered and said, I know that he shall rise in the resurrection at the last day. Christ says in this verse, these two verses, I am the resurrection. Not in the last days. I right now. You're saved. Yes, who saved you? The resurrection. Jesus Christ. When did he do it? Uh, my birthday's Friday. Friday, I'll be saved 62 years. That's something that Dr. Nelson led me in the Lord those many years ago. You know how many of those years I've been saved? All 62. Once saved, always saved. Always saved. You can't lose it. And this one, he said, I am the resurrection. There it is again. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me. That's all it takes to get saved. Not this belief. This belief. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. John, or Romans, uh, I'll get there in Romans 10, 10. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. You don't get saved by praying. You convey what your heart believes. All of a sudden, you see the truth. Two of them, three of them, actually. The first truth, you're not worth saving. You're, you're just a rotten sinner. And if it were for a gracious God who has a son that would do these seven things, you could never be saved. You could go to hell, and you deserve every ounce of it. But here it is. He gives you the gift of eternal life just by believing. And that's because He rose from the dead. They said to him on the cross, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Well, he didn't answer that, but I did. He looked at him and said, What a bet. Because <laughs> what happened? He died. And three days later, he rose from the dead. I am the resurrection and the life. You know when he died, he went three places. You find them all in the Bible. He went into Tartarus. Where all those wicked demons have been since the days of Noah. God locked him up. He still locks them in this place called Tartarus. Jesus went in there, showed him the nail pierced hands, and he sighed and said, You haven't seen anything yet. Where you see what my father and I are going to do to you. Then he stepped over across into the other side, into hell, Hades, right on the other side of Tartarus. That's where all the unsaved, the rich man in Luke 16. The hell lifted up his eyes, being in torment. They're there now, still in torment. And Jesus stepped in there in the scripture, you find it, and showed his hands, spoke to them, and told them, I'm the resurrection. It was true, you didn't believe it. Then he passed into paradise, which is right beside hell, which is right beside Tartarus. Paradise, by the way, you people listening here, you may have been taught this another way. The Old Testament saints are not in heaven. They were never promised heaven. They were promised the earth. And they will get the earth. Where are they? In paradise. They didn't leave. They're still down in paradise. And we in turn say we get heaven. We're not earthly people. We're heavenly people. And we're looking to live in the new Jerusalem up in heaven with the Lord. Well, here he is in his resurrection. Tartarus, Hades, <coughs> paradise. Then it took three days. He came back out of there. He stepped into the tomb. And in the tomb, the earthquake came later. In the tomb, leaving his body, this is his spirit that did these things. 
And he left his body and ascended out of that tomb and went up into heaven to be with the Lord. The angels said that broke an earthquake and shook the tomb and the stone rolled away. That's amazing. That stone rolled down to get in front of the door. I've been there. There's no preparation for the stone to roll any further down. When that earthquake came, that stone rolled up and went back to its position. It didn't do it so Jesus could get out. It's so that you and I and others could look and see that he is. And the angel says, why do you look for him here? He is not here, for he has risen from the dead. As he said, <laughs> Christ from oh, the resurrection. This is our sanctuary. Sanctuary is the place that you go. Uh, you might know from the Old Testament, the rocky road to the city of refuge. If you, uh, that's a sermon I preach here. If you accidentally kill someone, you too. Before you could get in a court hearing, you had to get to a city of refuge. You had to get inside that gate and then close it to keep <coughs> the relatives and the friends because whoso sheds man blood, by man shall his blood be shed. You went to the sanctuary city, and the sanctuary is where you're inside, and you are protected from any any interference of any kind. And that's what the resurrection did for you and for me. Listen, listen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. How long does it take to get there? About the same amount of time it took you to leave the tomb, go up to the heaven, be with his heavenly father. He came back down and bodily and, and showed himself around. But then he went up into heaven where he offered his blood on the real altar in payment for your sin and for mine. My the, the sanctuary is the place that you can go. Exodus 25 8 will tell you what the sanctuary is. It's like the city of refuge. He is to us that sanctuary. 2 Corinthians 5 17. I quoted that a minute ago. Ephesians 3.18. There's another verse about this. Uh, what are we getting deliverance from? What, what are you supposed to have deliverance from? Right? The cares of this world. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe that God believe also in me. My father's house are We're not supposed to carry worries. Hey, I, I probably ought to preach this to myself. Yeah, Joyce over there, she knows how much I fretted today over some of the things that they're going on. Uh, no, just, just rest in the Lord. He is our sanctuary. Well, verse 14 and verse number 6. 14 and verse number 6. He said here, uh, I, this is the word I just quote, let not your heart be troubled and believe in God, which also in me. I go down to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receiving myself to where I am. He may be also. Oh boy, look who answers the question here. Uh, where I am, you may be also. Thomas, doubting Thomas said, Then Lord, we know not whether thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to the Father but by me. Here he is. Jesus is our, here's, here's the word you've been waiting for, our salvation. The way, the truth, and the life is Christ providing not just salvation, but the completion of the new life that you have in Christ. One day be my death. Being a casket, I buried lady when I first got here. Uh, one of the first spirits, I was glad to be here. Uh, she was in the casket, and the older ladies came down to see her. And, and she looked good. They had her, the, the casket open. And I'm standing up here watching as they walked by. One lady, they both stood there and told how nice she looked. They reached over, patted her. And the one lady walked away. The other lady watched her leave. And she looked up to me and winked. She opened her purse. She pulled out a Twinkie. She put it under that lady's arm. She looked at me and she said, she just loves Twinkies. <laughs> I, I didn't take the Twinkie, but I imagine the people at the cemetery are probably took it. No sense leaving a good Twinkie inside the casket. But I tell you what, that dear lady saved. That was just her body. She left her body, and, and if you want to know how it works, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
you're clothed upon, you're not ready for your preaching. Paul said, I, you're clothed upon with a temporary house. He said, I groan within me for a body. And that body is called your temporary house. I don't know what it looks like, but I know it's acceptable to God. Otherwise, you couldn't. What happens to us from the time we die until the Lord comes? Well, you know you're not great and you're not wandering around. If you are, don't bother me. I, uh, I don't want to have you tap me on the shoulder and find out you're standing there. No, you're clothed upon with a temporary house so you can be in the presence of the Lord. And when the resurrection takes place, you come back to this earth where you died, where your body is. Somebody burned in the fire. They'll come back to that spot and they'll be resurrected right there. The sea will give up the dead that are in them. I've watched a few who put into the sea from our ship. They slid them over the side. Not a fun thing to watch. At that point, that's where that person will resurrect from. Oh my, if Jesus came right now. <laughs> it only takes a moment between them and I that all of us that are here that know Jesus Christ as personal Savior will leave this spot when right after the dead raised first. My mom and dad down in Crown Hill, they'll come out of section 69, grave 1718. The graves will be open, they'll receive, they'll enter in with the temporary body, they'll come out with their eternal bodies, be caught up to meet the Lord the earth said, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's this eternal life. This is our salvation. It's the, the word of truth, uh, it's the, the truth of the word, and it's the life that we receive boy. I love the stuff there, brother. Quickly look at chapter 15. You got two of them here. Verses 1 and 5. I am. That's that's uh, I may. That's I'm the eternal one. I am the true vine. And my father is the husband. Verse number 5. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth fruit, uh, much fruit. Uh, where without me you can do nothing. By the way, you have here in verse number two the word fruit. He beareth fruit. Also in verse two, he bears more fruit. And now here in verse five, he bears much fruit. That's what your Christian life is supposed to be doing. If you want to know the numbers in the sowing of the seed, the seed brought forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. Fruit would be 30. Imagine if each one of us let 30 people to Christ. Boy, oh, oh, that changed things right up here. In a minute. And, and then if you're really good at it, you can win 60 to Christ. And then you get done with that, say, so I got a lot of time to I'm going to reach 100. So one place is 90, other place is 100. You take the 100. You're 30, 60, and 90. 30, 60, and 100 fold. Then this is the, the, the word here, I am. He becomes the source of our fruit bearing. He is the source of our fruit bearing. You can't do that. Only God can do that. He works through you to let His Word convict that person of sin, and then He allows you to share the Romans Road or a John 3 is a good gospel. Uh, my Word there, even Old Testament scriptures, Isaiah 53 can be used to lead a soul to Christ. Find one that fits you. And use that to show somebody how to be saved. Watch for the sign. While you're talking, all of a sudden they can't look at you anymore. All of a sudden they start to move around a little bit. Why? Because it's going from here to here. They believe about God. They may tell you they even believe in God. But they don't have any peace because it's not in here. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Then with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Here you are with an opportunity to reach somebody with the gospel. I am the true vine. He is the source of our fruit bearing. Fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. If you want it again, it's in Matthew 13. You'll find it 30, 60, and 100 fold. Well, I told you there were eight. And another one is in another book. Take a look at it and uh, let me find it here. Mark chapter 14. The high priest came. They kept asking Jesus over and over again, are you the Christ? Are you the one? 
and he would never answer. He'd say, he told Bible, he said, well, you said it, bro. He didn't say the book. He said, thou said it. Boy, he frustrated Pilate. He said, I'm asking you. Well, you asked him, and you're the one that said it, so you must believe that I'm in Christ. Finally, he ended up in front of the high priest and his son. That high priest stood there and looked at him, hated him. And each one of the ones that said, crucify him. That's God's high priest. When Jesus walked in the room, what should he have done? He should have fallen on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. Instead, he rebuked him. And so when he said to him here, in, uh, in let's see where I'm going to find this. Uh, verse 61. He held his peace and answered nothing. And again, the high priest asked him and said, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the living God? Now, who said it? The high priest. You cannot lie to the high priest. You cannot fail to answer the high priest. And now the Son of God is facing Israel's appointed high priest. He had no choice but to answer. He had never admitted it. No one could prove it against or for or against. But when the priest asked it, he had to answer it. Look at verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. I am. I am the eternal one. He said, in essence, looking at the priest, and I made you. Look what the priest did. He said, I am. And he even answered more. He said, you'll see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, and he said, what need we any further evident witness? You have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned to be guilty of death. You saw this, friend, with the I am's? I don't think I put an S with this one. Uh, now that I think about it, I did put an S with it. Uh, God wants you to know for sure that you're saved. And He can go far enough to say it in the presence of His enemy. So you'd have the record that they would take him out and crucify him. Remember uh, Galatians 4, 4, and 5? In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem them that are under the law. Don't kid yourself. You and I both are under the law. It's written in our heart. And if you've, kid, if you've broken one law, you're guilty of all, the Bible says. That's how you get conviction to know that you need the blood of Christ to cleanse you from all sin. He said it openly. They took him out and crucified him. Oh, I'd like to bring a sermon here and I won't do it around. Uh, Christmas, I mean, like that word. Uh, the birth of Christ. But, but I'd sure like to get into a sermon about everything that happened here and how they, what these things did. God had all this plan that certain the other day before the foundation of the world. Before he ever made a, a globe, before he ever made a star, or ever made an animal or a bush, he'd already planned for Christ to be made a man and to die a man and to raise again as the Son of God to give you and me eternal life. And this is it in the eighth I am. That priest looked at it. You wonder the mind of Christ. I know he never feared. Don't you let people tell you that at the garden, Jesus said, Father, if it's possible, don't, don't make me go. That's not in your Bible. You're reading it wrong. I, I don't want to go to the cross, but if I have to go, then you can send me. That's a bunch of bunk. Yeah, the Bible said in Isaiah, he set his face as a flint to go to Calvary. Nobody could have talked him out of it. And here, he did this for you. He looked at that priest and said, I am the eternal one, and I made you. That priest ran his clothes, they took him out, they beat him, and I have a sermon on that. From there to Calvary is the most grotesque thing you've ever seen. If you use Isaiah and other Old Testament books in that rowdy, what he went through and what he, what he looked like, he couldn't carry his cross. The Catholics told you that. That lady that always wanted to sing that song, uh, the, about the stations of the cross. It's a beautiful song, but it's wrong. Jesus never carried the cross. He was too weak. He was too beaten. They had wrecked him. He was bleeding. The, 
Isaiah said, if you could have seen the portillier, that means point in time, image of his face, you wouldn't have recognized him to be a man. Isaiah said, if you would have seen the shadow of his body on the ground, the Bible said every joint is jointed. It wouldn't have looked like a human being. That's what Jesus went through. That's what this I am is. He came down with the push comes to show. I'm ready to go. And he did that for you and for me. Any lost sinner can believe that. Call upon the name of the Lord and you get the free gift of salvation. It isn't the praying that saves you. It's the believing. You believe in your heart and then you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And His blood will cleanse you from all sin. And the I Am will give you eternal life. Father, thank You for this tremendous passages. They're not there by I said it by accident. And I don't know if these folks picked up on what number eight means. Eight is the number of new beginnings. In, in less than a week, I have celebrated 62 years of being a born-again Christian. And I had nothing to do with that. Jesus paid it all. What a marvelous gift did our Savior provide for us that we have that gift of salvation. There's one person here in this message that has never bowed the knee before you, has never confessed before you, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I believe Christ died for me. And I want right now to trust Him and receive Him to be my personal Savior. With that comes eternal life and all of these seven I am's. Thank you for the message. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's sing the verse of the song, shall we? I didn't preach to an invitation. We'll go back there to 280. Kind of my feel that song on something like this and have a good peaceful thought to it. Song and tenderly. If you're not saved tonight, he's calling you. We'd like for you to put your faith and trust in Him.
Let's pray for one another. Give me a minute to get the door.